Good afternoon and welcome everyone on Techno Penang's Facebook page as well as YouTube channel to our very special program today, Path to Success the STEM Way. My name is Tim and I'll be your host for this afternoon. Now this is the second year running Techno Penang is hosting Path to Success where we chit chat with professionals from STEM industries to better understand what a STEM, STEM career looks like and if you're lucky, maybe even uncover the secrets to their success. It is our hope through this series of talks, we can help you viewers at home, both young and old, to better appreciate not only the importance of STEM, but also its fun side, because it's never too late to begin exploring the amazing world of STEM. Now today, we are joined by a very special guest who will be speaking to us about how engineers are the occupation of the future. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Peter Ling. Uh, Peter is a Dean's List Electrical and Electronic uh, degree graduate from the Swinburne University of Technology in Sarawak. Peter is currently the Vice Chairperson of the Institute of Engineering and Technology Young Professional Section, who has competed in many, many global competitions around the world. Peter is also a self-professed tech geek who enjoys playing pian uh, violin in his, during his leisure time. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Peter Ling. Hi, Peter. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, team. Thanks for having me here today. Right. Uh, so before we continue, uh, Peter, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about yourself? Specifically, what exactly is the IET? Oh, okay. Um, my name is Peter Ling. I'm currently a PhD student at Monash University of Malaysia under a full scholarship. So I'm working on computer vision and machine learning techniques for soft robotic applications. Throughout the years, I had the opportunities to get involved in a lot of events and competitions ranging from state level to international level. Outside the university, as mentioned just now, I am the vice chairperson of the IET Malaysia Network Young Professional Section or YPS. Now, the IET stands for the Institution of Engineering and Technology. It is a multidisciplinary engineering, uh, professional engineering institution based in the UK with over 168,000 members in 150 countries. Today, I'll share with you my thoughts on STEM education. Right, uh, back to you, Tim. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Peter. I hope that clears up for everyone at home. What exactly is the IET, all right? Okay, so moving on, um, maybe we want to know a little bit more about our speaker for today. So I'd like to ask sure. uh, Peter, uh, okay. when did you actually start taking an interest in STEM? Was there a main influencing factor in your decision to pursue STEM as an education and career? All right. Um, since young, I've been interested in science and technology. I wonder how things work and why things behave the way they do. I love creating new things with my knowledge. So back then, we did not even have touch screens on our phones. Phone screens were just black and white with no camera, no WhatsApp, no Facebook, no videos whatsoever. I had to literally press the button a few times just to uh, type a single English letter. Then one day, the first iPhone was introduced and it revolutionized the whole smartphone market and its popularity remains even to this day. Now, to give you another example, back in the days, we need a floppy disk this big, just to store 1.5 megabytes of data. Today, a memory card this small is able to hold 500 gigabytes of data. That's 300,000 times more storage in a small card the size of your fingertip. I'm very fortunate to be born in such an era to witness the drastic improvement in technology. That got me very excited because there are surprises in technological advancement every now and then. Now, uh, let me tell you a bit of history. For thousands of years, the Great Pyramid in Egypt was the tallest structure in the world with a height of around 140 meters. Fast forward to the end of 20th century, buildings were already much taller than the once tallest Great Pyramid. The Comta in Penang, also known as the Penang Island Tower, which is where Tech Doom is located, is 100 meters taller than the Great Pyramid. In the 1990s, Malaysia built the Petronas Twin Towers 
at the ebb flows more than three times the height of the pyramid. The Twin Towers were the tallest man-made structure in the world at that time. In the ensuing 20 years, skyscrapers got taller and taller. Today, we have a 118-story building called Meritika 118 in Malaysia. It's interesting to see how much engineering technology has progressed over this short period of time. We are in an era where the ancient dreams have become a reality. In Chinese mythology, there are stories about seeing and hearing over vast distances. We could understand that these abilities were once what people could only dream of. But today, we have the technology. The internet connects us all together. We can have a live video session today with low latency, although I'm not physically in Penang. We can even video call and talk to somebody on the other side of the earth in real time. To illustrate further, we have telescopes that enable us to view billions of light years away and understand how minute and seemingly insignificant we are uh, in the vast universe. That makes us humble because there are many mysteries that we haven't solved, a lot of things that we still don't understand. And of course, it means a lot of potential and room for new technologies to be invented. We know a lot of things, but what we don't know is a lot more. But, uh, back to you, right. Ian. Yeah, it's, it's so true that nowadays, you know, technology is advancing so fast. Then we yeah. always, you know, trying to catch up with technology. Exactly. Right? So yeah. uh, I, I believe it's easier nowadays for, you know, children to pick up on technology, to be fascinated by technology is whether, what is the next step to that? You know, maybe they started playing with iPad. So how do they, you know, progress from their interest in iPad to something more concrete in STEM, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so maybe now let's uh, go back slightly in time. So Peter, uh, maybe we want to find out, do you actually have sure. a favorite subject in school? Uh, maybe what subject and why do you pick that subject? Or do you have any interesting stories in school that are, you know, science related or technology related? In secondary school, my favorite subject was physics. I could learn a lot of, about the physical workings of the natural world, mainly on matter and energy and how they interact with each other. It's the curiosity in me that makes me want to discover more. When I was in my school years, I was always fascinated by wireless technologies. It seemed like magic to me. How could devices communicate with each other without wires? To add on, the connection is always there, even if you put a physical barrier in between the two devices. And also, how could people control a robot that is on Mars millions of kilometers away from the Earth? If you think about it, it takes about half a year to travel to Mars, but we could send a signal from Earth to Mars in just three minutes. In general, I was inclined towards math and science subjects. More than studying for exam, I enjoyed the process of gaining new knowledge. Um, in fact, since primary school, I had a lot of opportunities to join STEM-related activities. I was active in robotics, building Lego robots to complete various missions. Unlike the situation now whereby robotics is very popular among school students, back then, only three of us in the school got to join the competition uh, and learn about Lego robots. There were few tutorials help for the students and all the participants of the robotics competition from various schools would have to travel to a particular school to attend the sessions. I remember one of the missions was to build a robot to climb up a flight of stairs. I was very excited and I couldn't fall asleep at night as I was always thinking of, of uh, new solutions. Um, in another event, I was lucky enough to meet and shake hands with our Malaysian astronaut. Dr. Dr. Shep Musafa. Now that experience made me feel that STEM has indeed benefited mankind a lot. 
without science, we would still be thinking at that the Earth is flat. And without engineering, we would never have gotten off the ground. We wouldn't have airplanes and helicopters, not to mention rockets and space stations. In a secondary school physics competition, my friends and I made a prototype to showcase wireless power transmission, which really amazed my teachers and schoolmates. We wanted to go beyond the school syllabus and show to others that science is not a boring subject after all. Uh, we have the power to make STEM alive, and it's a choice that anyone can make to learn more about STEM and share the joy with others. All right, Tim. Right. Uh, so I, I also strongly believe, right, a lot of people who are mm -hmm. in the STEM industry right now, usually uh, most of them, they have a very inquisitive mind, meaning that during school time, yes. they are always asking questions. They want to know why, why, why this, why, you know, why can we do this? Why can't we do that? Mm -hmm. So I believe uh, this is one of the uh, key key features that a young person should have, you know, always, you know, asking, always want to know the curiosity when uh, during their, their schooling days. Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay. Uh, next thing, I, I'm i sure a lot of people uh, right now, they, they they are facing with a choice in school, whether to okay. uh, pick up science stream or not science stream. So, uh, unfortunately, right now, we are based on the numbers we have from the government, the, the education uh, department. They're telling us that a lot of students are choosing not to pursue uh, science stream, mainly because they believe that the subjects are hard, too hard, and it might pull down their uh, results, their grade. So in the end, you impact their uh, life choices. So I now see. maybe you can tell us, is it really necessary to have excellent results in order to have a successful career in STEM? Mm. I would say that you don't need to pass your exam with flying colors in order to pursue a career in STEM, but an impressive results certificate would definitely grant you more opportunities. At the very least, you should have obtained some knowledge through the relevant STEM subjects. Let me start with secondary school. Students intending to take up further studies in STEM should have good knowledge of science and be well-versed in mathematical calculations. This would give you a solid foundation for a smooth transition into tertiary studies in STEM afterwards. Um, mathematics is important because it's widely used in the domain of science and technology. It's like a language. If you have good command of it, then you are more likely to be able to easily understand the formulas and apply them in your studies. But uh, I have to say that more than that, Patient is still the most important. I've met people who don't like math that much, but they could still perform well in STEM subjects. It's the patient in them that gets them going. Of course, in any subject, uh, there will be topics that you fancy and topics that you don't. It's completely natural. Do not think that you don't have a patient in STEM just because there are certain topics in a particular subject that you find overwhelming. Also, as a secondary school student, you should try to excel in other subjects like languages, moral studies, and history. Some of you might think that these subjects are not important for a STEM student. Now, keep in mind that if you are aiming for a scholarship, you need to be an all-rounder with good results in all subjects. Even if you are not aiming for a scholarship, in the future, companies that you apply to work for might still look at your SPM cert and depending on the company, they might prefer someone who excelled at everything over someone who only did well in STEM subjects. My next point is, if you have the passion in STEM, and for some reason, did not do well in exams, don't give up on your journey. It's still a long way. 
you may not be enter you may not be able to enter the top notch university that you have always dream about but it's okay you can always work harder in your university years to become an expert in your own field of choice even for someone who did not do well in university as long as they have met uh, the minimum requirements and successfully graduated they can still catch up in their working years gaining valuable industrial experience and becoming better as time goes by all i want to say here is that uh, having excellent exam results is no doubt favorable as it will open up more opportunities for you but still it's not the prerequisite to land you on a successful career in stem right so mm. uh, maybe easily we can summarize this is as long as you don't fail you're safe okay so <laughs> even though if you struggle in school uh, in secondary school or even in university it doesn't mean it's the end of the road for you there's still mm -hmm. yes. another door for you to pursue so don't give up that's the thing don't give up if you love science if you love technology even though your your results may not reflect your love for science or technology it's not a sign to give up right okay so peter just now uh, earlier you mentioned that patience is uh, one of the key attributes that someone should have in order mm, yes. to do well in stem so maybe can you share with us some other uh, attributes or skills that we need to you know in order to excel in a stem career uh, okay mm. in terms of skills first and foremost you need the core skills related to your field of choice as an example someone who works in computer software engineering must have programming skills necessary to create software uh, someone who's in electrical engineering must have the analytical skills uh, required to do circuit analysis. Same goes to pure physics, pure mathematics, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, biotechnology, and so on. The, those technical skills are the essential skills that qualify you to be a practitioner in your own field. Now we talk about soft skills. Soft skills are abilities that relate to how you work and how you interact with other people. Examples of soft skills include emotional intelligence, leadership, teamwork, adaptability, and growth mindset, to name a few. Um, unlike technical skills, which can be easily measured through paper-based or practical examinations, soft skills are not as straightforward but they are still crucial towards building a successful career in the future. Whenever possible, you should take time and effort to brush up your soft skills, even in your school years. It's much easier if you start from a young age. By doing so, you will have the upper hand when you come out to work in the future. I find it a lot of time uh, soft skills are not really emphasized by teachers in secondary schools partly because the measure of success in secondary school is typically based on exam results although there have been some improvements lately take emotional intelligence as an example eq is the ability to recognize and manage your emotions and the emotions of others in one analysis of new employees who did not meet expectations during the first 18 months on the job, 23%, right? 23% well, due to low emotional intelligence. Leadership is very important as well because as you climb the ladder, there may be times that you need to lead a team of people. Even though you may become a scientist who mostly works in the lab, there will be instances where you may become the lead scientist who needs to lead a, a team of researchers. Along with leadership, we have teamwork. Teamwork is a collaborative effort of a group to achieve a common goal. You need to know how to work with people in order to achieve team synergy. 
whereby the combined output of a team through good teamwork is greater than the total output if team members were to work separately. This is relevant to STEM field. Mm, as a lot of times, people like doctors, scientists, and engineers tend to work in groups. Other than that, you need to have adaptability. The world today is rapidly changing and you need to keep up with the pace. 15 years ago, Internet Explorer was still the market leader. Everyone was using Internet Explorer, but in 2022, its market share has dropped to less than 3%. And if you follow the news, last week the browser was discontinued. My point is that the world is changing and we have to be flexible enough to embrace change in order to build a successful STEM career. Right, Tim. Right. Uh, yeah. So like with any other job, I believe that you need a very fine balance between soft skill as well as technical skill required in your job. So uh, all these things, of course, none of us uh, knows it uh, instantly from birth, right? We pick up these skills along the way. So even though you feel like you might not be suitable for the job that you want in the future, but uh, I believe strongly, at least I believe strongly that with mm -hmm. time, you can pick up all these skills, right? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, okay. so, it applies uh, to all, all jobs. Soft yeah, skills are, yeah, and right. hard skills are both important. Right, 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 right. Exactly. All right. So, uh, okay. So let's say, uh, for example, now uh, I'm a college graduate from an uh, 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 engineering school. So I graduated with, uh, let's say, a mechanical engineering degree. So I want to pursue a job as an engineer. Maybe can you tell us uh, briefly what is uh, the job description, uh, the, the job progression for someone working in an engineering field? Job that means engineering. how do they start? You know, what is the midpoint? How do they, what is the, you know, end result of uh, working in the engineering field? Mm, okay. An engineering degree opens up uh, an array of opportunities. I've even known people who did an engineering degree and then ventured into business. Although this is an unconventional approach, uh, the way of engineering thinking has helped them tremendously in their career. But for the sake of today's discussion, I'll focus on two mainstream pathways, which are first entering the engineering industry and second entering the academic world. Usually in the second year or third year of a four year engineering program, students will be required to um, undertake an internship whereby they could work for a company of their choice for a period of three, three to six months. This gives them an early exposure to the engineering world out of the university and also an opportunity uh, to be hired by the university, uh, by, the, the, by the company that they work for if they perform considerably well. If a graduate decides to enter the industry, usually he or she would be hired as an engineer. Uh, according to the Board of Engineers Malaysia, it's mandatory for university graduates to register as graduate engineer if he or she wants to take up employment as a graduate engineer. After working for several years, the engineer may be promoted to higher levels such as senior engineer or project manager. They may even end up uh, taking leadership positions in the company. Now, for someone in the academic world, uh, one of the goals is to do research at a university to discover new knowledge that would benefit the engineering world. Sometimes this new knowledge can be directly applied to the industry. In the academic world, there are lecturing jobs. You can choose to be a lecturer to teach subjects of your interests and groom the next generation of engineers. Typically, 
a student who intends to go into the academic world would apply for a postgraduate course at master's or PhD level. Um, if you excel in your bachelor's degree, you have a higher chance of getting a scholarship for your postgraduate course. Right. Uh, back to you, Tim. Right. Uh, so, is is can you maybe uh, is it always the same steps that people need to take in the engineering field? Meaning that even though I'm a mechanical engineering, my friend is a E and E engineer. Is it always the same? It means the job progression. Is it, you know, first I join as a graduate engineer, then maybe after a few years I become a, a senior engineer. Maybe if I'm lucky enough, I become a manager or head of department. Is it always the same, or is there diversions in certain fields? Uh, okay, if you're going through the mainstream pathway, then generally you will start as an engineer and slowly work your way up. However, there are also some opportunities uh, out there. You can also be a teacher, you can start your own business, uh, you can be an insurance agent, real estate agent, um, anything. But uh, what I want to say here is that uh, engineering degree opens up the opportunities for you and the way of engineering thinking would help you in your career in the future, no matter which field you are in. It doesn't mean that you have to restrict yourself to a particular uh, field. For example, you don't have to restrict. If, if I, I was in uh, E and E and E, so when you graduated, you don't have to restrict yourself to uh, electrical field, for example. You can also go into software engineering, you can go into electronic field, or you can go to robotics and so on. So it, you, you have to be flexible about it. Right. Right, right. So as Peter said, it's not set in stone. So even though yeah. <laughs> you, uh, yeah. So even though you, your course mates, you know the one you graduate together, you might all end up in different places. It doesn't have to be the same pathway for everyone. So that's why, even though uh, you don't choose, even though if you graduate with an engineering degree, you are not stuck in the engineering world forever. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All uh, right. So maybe, uh, okay. That's uh, a very good point. I feel about uh, an engineering degree. Maybe can you tell us a bit more? What else can the engineering uh, course offer uh, the offer graduates? Maybe in terms of stability or job opportunities or even income. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, first of all, if you are studying in Malaysia, Malaysia is blessed with the vibrant cultural diversity. When you live in Malaysia, you get to meet and work with people from different cultural backgrounds. If you are looking for a university to take up a STEM-related course, there are many options. We have government universities, we have private universities, and foreign university branch campuses, uh, like Monash, Swinburne, Southampton, Nottingham, and Curtin, to name a few. Compared to studying abroad, if you are uh, completing a degree locally, it doesn't cost you that much. And today we do have um, a number of universities with relatively high QS rankings. And many universities also do offer an exchange program whereby you could study at a different university. Uh, maybe uh, out of the country you are in for one semester while still paying the local tuition fee. Uh, besides, um, you are better equipped with the early exposure to the industry. Uh, for example, as I mentioned just now, in your second or third year, you are required to do an internship program. Um, now, if you study abroad, you would get some benefits uh, other than those related to engineering, such as the global perspective and unique life experience. In terms of academic research, there are a lot of research intensive universities offering STEM courses at the postgraduate level. So you can leverage on this in order to build a successful career in the future if you are planning to venture into the academic world. All right. 
All right. So uh, as Peter shared, of course, uh, studying an engineering degree, uh, it will help you in your career choice. So I could say that start uh, picking an engineering uh, uh, program is a very safe bet for someone in Malaysia, right? Uh, okay. So maybe now uh, we go into a slightly more challenging question. So uh, Peter. Okay, sure, sure. Earlier, yeah. we mentioned about how technology is advancing so fast. You know, we are discovering new things in technology every day. So one of the aspects that uh, in technology that is rapidly progressing is AI or artificial intelligence, right? Okay. So maybe some people might be wondering, with the advancement in AI, is there a possibility that one day AI will take over the engineering role? Meaning that there are no need for human engineers anymore. Is there a chance that will happen? Uh, well, uh, this has been a classic question since the advent of artificial intelligence or AI. The generalized version is whether or not uh, computers would replace humans at work. The short answer to this is it will eventually replace most of the tasks done by humans. Now, allow me to elaborate. We have all seen the potential of machines replacing humans. For instance, it was portrayed in the movie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, uh, whereby the father's work of screwing toothpaste caps onto tubes of toothpaste was <clears throat> replaced by robots that could do the same job at just a fraction of the speed. Uh, to give you a real world example, in the past, before a car exits from the shopping mall, the driver will have to pay the parking ticket at a booth. Inside the booth, there would be a human attendant who collects the parking fee. Then at some point, the human operated booths were replaced by auto pay machines. The machine is able to check the sum of money inserted and then give out the correct change. And the parking, uh, parking system evolves further. Going forward, some shopping malls nowadays have uh, implemented a carpet recognition system, eliminating the need for a physical parking ticket. My view is that any repetitive tasks would eventually be replaced by machines because they are extremely efficient at it. To quote from Time magazine, one study estimates that about 400,000 jobs were lost to automation in US factories from 1990 to 2007. According to a recent paper by economists at MIT and Boston University, uh, robots could replace as many as 2 million more workers in manufacturing alone by the year 2025. The question is, will engineering jobs be replaced? The answer is yes and no. Today we have seen the power of softwares such as MATLAB in enabling complex calculations and AutoCAD in providing the tools for computer-aided designs. Softwares could even help you to optimize your solutions. A lot of the taxing tasks have diminished due to the introduction of engineering softwares. The CEO of IBM came up with the concept that if you reverse the letters AI to IA, you go from artificial intelligence to intelligent assistant. So if we look at it from another perspective, AI is something that makes our job much easier. That means that uh, engineers now have more time and capacity to do the creative tasks, which are not what the AI is good at, at least for now. Creative tasks would require the power of the human brain. We need engineers to come up with innovative solutions. In fact, the demand for en engineers is ever increasing to cope with the rapid technological advancement. So no worries on that. Uh, so will some 
engineering tasks be replaced by computers? Yes, definitely, and it's a good thing anyways. Going back to the main question, will engineering jobs be obsolete one day? My answer is most likely no, at least not in the future that we can foresee. Okay, uh, back to you, Tim. Right, so uh, according to Peter, AI is, is not only not harmful to engineers, but it's actually helpful to them by helping them, you know, doing all the tedious jobs and letting the engineers right. focus on more important creative or more tasks. creative jobs, right? So AI, investment in AI actually helps engineers as opposed to uh, in other industries where AI is straight replacing the human workforce. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So for those, uh, if you want to be 100% safe, maybe you can be an engineer that designs AI. Then your job is 100% safe. <laughs> because you will not That's be a good idea. the AI itself, right? right. Uh -huh. So, okay. Uh, so, next question I'd like to ask is, uh, mm -hmm. we we discussed a lot of good things about, you know, engineers, you know, we have job stability, we have a lot of opportunities, even the the boogeyman, the AI that is scaring so many people is actually helpful to engineers, right? So, is it really all good things about engineers or are there challenges faced by uh not only engineers, but STEM practitioners today. And maybe how should they prepare themselves to overcome uh, these challenges they face in their careers? Okay. Um, in my opinion, one of the main challenges faced by STEM practitioners today is that the world is changing, right? is due to the dynamic environment of STEM. The world is ever-changing. There is nothing permanent in this world except change. Uh, the healthcare system has changed a lot. From the 19th century to the 21st century, human life expectancy had increased by more than 30 years, three zero years. Uh, this implies that on average, people in the world today can live 30 years longer as compared to people in the past. What's happening here? Today, we have modern techniques like X-ray, uh, MRI, computer tomography, laser surgery, open heart surgery, and so on. Furthermore, uh, we have new medical research papers coming out every now and then. Also, we have new medications invented from time to time. This means that uh, the doctors would have to, to adapt to new technologies and new methods. Because if they don't, our healthcare system would be stagnant. This applies to all STEM areas. We should not be complacent. Continuous learning is the way forward. In fact, there's a saying that goes, uh, the more you learn, the more you earn. Okay, The softwares that I had learned to use uh, in my university years might not be applicable to the world 20 years from now. There's also a possibility that the scientific knowledge that we have gained today might be corrected or updated through new discoveries in the future. Change is inevitable. To quote from Winston Churchill, to improve is to change. So that's all I want to say. Right. I like, I like the saying that you, uh, you share with us now, to learn is to earn. So yeah, it's true because we've been saying this over and over again. Technology is yeah. always progressing, it's always advancing. So if you don't catch up, you'll be left behind. So yes. if you are someone who is, you know, uh, not that keen in, you know, keeping updating yourself, then maybe engineering is not for you, right? So uh, as a someone in a STEM field, we we need to be uh, always, you know, finding new things, always learning. So this is, I feel, uh, I agree with uh, what Peter said, that one of the main challenges, if you don't keep adapted, you'll be left. Right. Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, finally, uh, Peter, what advice would you offer to aspiring students who are thinking of pursuing a STEM career? Okay. Uh, my advice is to be patient. Take it step by step. 
you have to learn to work before you can run. Get a solid foundation in STEM, try to aim for good results in school. This will enable you to have more opportunities in the future. And these opportunities will translate into more choices for you to shape your own future. Let me share with you a psychological test called the marshmallow test. So what happened was that uh, the researchers would get a few kids and ask them, do you want a marshmallow now? Or if you could wait for a moment, I'll give you two marshmallows. They noted down the kids' responses and tracked uh, the kids for decades. The finding was the kids who wanted the marshmallow immediately turned out to be less successful in their adulthood. Conversely, the kids who could wait for a moment to get two marshmallows became people of higher social status. This is in line with a concept called delayed gratification, which means the ability to postpone an immediate gain in favor of a greater reward in the future. Therefore, you may choose to relax now and get a lower pay in the future, or you may choose to work hard now, become someone successful in the years to come. The choice is yours. Uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, I believe uh, what you say is very true. It's even in one of our famous, you know, BM sayings, you know, sake sake dahulu, senang senang kemudian. Right? So thanks again, Peter, for taking this time to share your knowledge and your information with us. I'm sure the view was Uh, uh, did, I, did I cut out just now? Okay, uh, so guys, uh, we want to thank uh, Mr. Peter once again for taking the time uh, sharing his knowledge and information with us as well as all the advice he has shared with us. I hope all of you will take something home today from his sharing today. So before we say bye to Mr. Peter, Mr. Peter has uh, graciously shared his contacts in case you have any questions you want to ask. You're too shy to ask during the, this session today. So you can find him on Facebook uh, at uh, Peter Ling TR or his LinkedIn page at Peter Ling Ting Rang, right? So if you have any questions or you are seeking some advice, you can always contact him through these uh, social medias. All right. So once again, thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you all have a great day ahead and see you all in the next session. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.